Hello and welcome to the Kunstler Cast. Thanks for listening. My guest today is an old friend, Dmitry Orlov. We were both thinking and writing along similar lines back around 2005. I published my book, The Long Emergency, about the prospect for an American collapse, and Dmitry published his excellent book, Reinventing Collapse, which compared the Soviet experience of the 1990s to the American prospect. It was an insightful and very funny book, full of great quips. He followed that with another excellent book, The Five Stages of Collapse, and has published a lot of other books since then. He spent about half his life in the USA and half his life in Russia, both before and after the Soviet collapse of the 1990s. He moved back to St. Petersburg a few years ago after living on a boat along the east coast of the USA. Well, he's a very interesting and mordant observer of the international scene. And here is our confab. Dmitry Orlov, it's a pleasure to talk to you again. It's been quite a while. Um, we were hanging out a little bit, at least on computer, before you left the USA. And now you're in St. Petersburg, Russia. Can you uh, begin by giving us an overview of how the Soviet collapse happened and how it rolled out in terms of the disorder of everyday life? It's a huge topic, so uh, it's very hard to summarize it. What happened essentially from the point of view of of just regular everyday people is that uh, the foundations of their life that seemed completely unshakable pretty much crumbled. So uh, before, everybody was guaranteed employment from the moment they graduated from whatever university or institute or trade school. It might not have been in any of the large cities. Jobs were apportioned based on where they were needed, not where people wanted to live. But they were guaranteed a job. The income was guaranteed. It bought you uh, a certain uh, basket of uh, necessities. All of the essentials, such as, uh, you know, reasonable living conditions, uh, heat, hot water in most places, uh, public transportation, medical care, education for kids, daycare, old age homes, all of that stuff was taken care of, perhaps not to the highest level, but to an acceptable level. And suddenly all of that went away and suddenly people who still had jobs uh, were being paid in whatever the factory produced. So if, if, if the factory made toasters, you were paid in toasters because uh, there was no way to sell them. There was no economy to sell toasters into. A lot of people simply didn't get paid for a really long time. Suddenly, a lot of people had to start raising their own food or gathering it or producing it somehow. And a lot of people basically just had to hustle. A lot of people started traveling and uh, with you know, returning with bags full of consumer goods that they could sell, things like shampoo and soap and shavers and, and batteries and things like that, whereas what they went away with was watches and, and jewelry and things they could sell to raise some money. So that was basically the, the new way of being that suddenly erupted into existence when the old scheme uh, pretty much failed Um because the people in charge of it decided that it wasn't making them rich enough fast enough. Dimitri, to me, the most remarkable thing about the Soviet collapse was the relative bloodlessness of the whole thing, at least in the sense of, you know, public mayhem that usually attends the overthrows of regimes. Perhaps the damage was only manifested in the after effects of the of the regime change, shall we say? Well, there, there was really no regime change because the the uh, the old uh, Soviet authorities, the party types, they stayed in power. They just uh, changed job descriptions and job titles. But they did also, uh, let's face it, they changed in a major way the economic organization of the society. Well, yes, uh, the, they did a very political and economic uh demolition job and mm-hmm. they also let in a whole bunch of vultures that that uh, scavengers that basically picked away at the ruins of the soviet economy 
exporting whatever valuable things they could, including a lot of people. As far as bloodlessness, uh, 10 million people that didn't live to see a, a reasonable ripe old age, you know, that... Well, the conventional explanation me. for that is uh, the death by despair and alcoholism. How true was that? A lot of people got shot. Shot? Just plain shot? Just plain shot. Hmm. We didn't hear about that much in, in the West. And well, you were here a, at the time. Yes, there was a fantastic crime wave. There was a time when women couldn't go out without a bodyguard. Uh -huh. um, oh, but that's different than, you know, the institutional rounding up and execution of citizens. Oh, yes. No, I'm not talking about the government shooting people. Right. Uh, I'm talking about freelance um, murder. And Just a basically public disorder. Uh, you could call it public disorder, or uh, you could uh, basically uh, call it an ethnic mafia a replacement economy taking mm -hmm. shape and then being destroyed and supplanted by you know your normal state capitalism, uh, which is what exists today. Uh, you spent many years living in both the U.S. and, and Russia, part of your childhood in each part of your adulthood in each. What's your take on differences in the national character between the two of us? Very dissimilar because uh, the Russians basically base their entire ethos on a conception of justice that uh, Americans would find completely alien and would not understand, don't even have words for it. Something that perhaps Americans could approach from the point of view of community standards exists at, in Russia at at a very basic level. So, but, but Americans approach it from the point of view of law and order. So if somebody doesn't behave they're supposed to, the police get cold. Whereas um, in Russia, if, if you don't behave according to societal norms, you're much more likely to just simply get punched in the face. <laughs> So that, that's the basic difference. And also from the American point of view, what is expected of them, what is considered decent behavior, is not something that they would automatically appreciate not being Russian. Mm -hmm. So there's a giant gulf, I would say, that exists between the, the two civilizations. Your excellent book, uh, Reinventing Collapse, which came out around 2005 or six, mm -hmm. made a case that the way Soviet uh, economics were organized tended to um, create a kind of uh, a cushion for people to fall back on and reorganize their societies in terms of food, shelter, transportation, etc. Can you describe how that worked in, in Russia 30 years ago and why it would be probably a good deal different in the USA today? if we were to undergo a, a kind of a collapse? Well, yes, uh, the Soviet uh, system had some inefficiencies and uh, uh, some, some rather uh, huge failings, such as the inability to deliver a sufficient amount of uh, blue jeans and Coca-Cola and chewing gum. <laughs> but in, in other areas, it, it was very, very kind of uh, solidly organized to provide a, a life support system that really didn't, didn't exist on there being a thriving or even profitable enterprise of any sort. Things were basically just uh, moved around on schedule. Crops were planted, collected, and distributed, processed into foodstuffs. Nobody lost the roof over their head because it was all just owned by the government and allocated based on need. When the collapse happened, there were no foreclosures or evictions. Well, yes, the, the concept didn't exist. You basically had the place you lived inscribed in your internal passport and nobody could dislodge you from it by any means at all, uh, other than the government stepping in and saying, we condemn this property, and therefore you're moving to this other property. Um, and, and people were already used to food shortages and long lines to get things to eat. They were used to gardening in their country places. Well, they were used to standing in line for bananas, but they were not used to being deprived of uh, bread or grain 
uh, certain things were considered luxuries. You know, not not everybody could afford, you know, to pay foreign currency for foie gras in the foreign currency store. <laughs> but the basics were all there. There, there was no hunger. Uh, there was uh, very little malnutrition. And it generally, when it existed, it, it had to do with other societal problems, not with the government not doing its job. Yeah, but when um, that flipped, what happened? When it flipped, people still got by, but they, they had to hustle a lot. They, they had to resort to makeshift free enterprise and, and uh, had to grow and gather some of their own food, plant their own potatoes, let's say. A lot of that went on starting in, in 91 through about 95, at which point uh, there was basically a new economy that was a little shaky, that had a lot of uh, mafia influence in it, a lot of ethnic mafias that owned kiosks that sold just about everything. So the currency was none too stable, but this new kind of uh, pseudo free market economy did take take hold within within about a five year period. Where would you say the U.S. stands now in the collapse process? I ask you that because you were a real student of these uh, parallel collapses. Well, yes. Well, with the United States, it's really hard to say because unlike uh, the Soviet Union, unlike Russia, the U.S. has led off with social and cultural collapse. And what's going on in terms of financial collapse is absolutely impossible to gauge because it's completely disconnected from the physical economy of goods and services that actually serve people in any significant way. Certain elements of... Um, of the American economy, such as the the ownership society that we heard something about under George Bush Jr., uh, has collapsed so that now you can stay wherever you are without paying rent. Yeah, you're talking about the moratoriums due to COVID. Well, yes, and due, due to whatever. The point is that people no longer uh, own whatever they consider their property, cannot dispose of it in, in any reasonable fashion. And eventually, everything will be owned by by a set of banks. So, so really, we're looking at some financial institutions that are masking financial collapse as it affects individuals within society. Um, so that that's definitely happening. Um, uh, as far as uh, commercial collapse, well, there is still does this abject de- dependence on imports from China, where China is resorting to all kinds of neat tricks to basically ration its exports to the United States, and it's a matter of time before the, the shelves become bare, because the United States no longer has the ability to produce much of anything. It's all about disconnect and disbelief, and, and um, the thing to understand about the United States is that the propaganda in the United States is so much more powerful than in Russia. You know, the Soviet propaganda was sort of, was, was blah. Nobody really even paid attention to it very much. Whereas the Americans really uh, know what to think based on what they see on the TV. You bet. And half the country believes it vehemently and half the country doesn't believe it at all. I want you to uh, go back a little bit and drill down on what was the subject of one of your next books, The Five Stages of Collapse, and give us a bit about the declensions of uh, different kinds of collapse in society so that the listeners have a clear view of of how they generally follow? Well, I basically split it up into uh, categories that that could be be parsed out, separated out, which is uh, financial collapse, which then drives commercial collapse due to lack of credit, uh, which then drives political collapse due to uh, lack of tax revenue, uh, which then drives social collapse uh, because uh, basically the government can no longer... Uh, support society in in the usual way and the private charities are not powerful enough and eventually you get to cultural collapse where basically uh, families dissolve and and people stop resembling people and start acting more like wild animals (laughs) well you you said a few moments ago that uh, the uh, American collapse as, as you view it from abroad was not proceeding 
in in the same way that the Soviet collapse did in terms of this declension or order of different different uh, orders of collapse. So, uh, how is the American collapse uh, going in those terms? Well, I think that cultural collapse came first. The United States, if you uh, go back a few generations, back to the time when women wore dresses and men wore hats and ties and, and were well-spoken when in public, that is just a completely different society that is just gone, evaporated. So it was replaced by these people who are slovenly. They don't speak English well. They write it even worse, the ones who can, can write it at all. And in, instead of basically having the the Anglo gold standard, which everyone, you know, be they Italians or Jews or whatever, emulated and tried to copy, instead you have this free for all where nobody knows really what the standard is. What seems to be celebrated is some kind of uh, uh, being substandard in some in some victimized fashion. So that's that's just complete disappearance of of the ethnic stability. Of, of of the of the American civilization. Yeah, I, I would validate what you're saying because I spent quite a bit of the COVID nineteen months looking at Turner classic movies from the nineteen thirties, and the difference just in in manners and personal presentation in public is really striking. It is. It is, and I run into that a lot because when I say America to non Americans. They think about Kathleen Turner. They think about Cary Grant. They think they're from Wayne. And I tell them that they're, they're all dead, okay? And the country that they're from no longer exists. They look at me sort of in surprise and don't really understand what I'm saying. Yeah. So that's as far as cultural collapse. As far as social collapse, there's a, a, a strange mixture of extreme heavy-handedness and complete neglect. So if you, if you look at uh, various uh, educational institutions, public schooling, for instance, incredibly heavy-handed in terms of what goes and what doesn't and how you might run afoul. On the other hand, uh, just completely neglectful of the actual needs of the people. So you, w once you're done with those institutions, you've been processed in some manner, you're just basically spat out into the world. You know, Here's your degree, go live under a bridge. <laughs> That's basically it. And so social collapse is, is pretty much done. As far as political collapse, well, you know, fish rots from the head. So let's look at the head. We have we have this uh, strange creature within the White House who was first elected to the Senate 50 years ago. And that's basically the time when he stopped using or, you know, having to use his brain because that's not what you do in the U.S. Senate. You just basically follow orders. Uh, by people who pay for your for for your campaigns, uh, so this is somebody who hasn't used his brain in 50 years. You know, at this point, you know, it's he he's basically just a puppet. And then, as his sidekick is some kind of fancy exotic call girl. You know, and that, that's that, that's basically what we have in, in the White House. And then and then the entire cabinet and the State Department and. Uh, I think to an increasing extent, the, the Pentagon as well is is basically staffed by uh, zealots of a very peculiar kind. Um, I would compare it to basically picking a whole bunch of uh, uh, communist revolutionaries, you know, Trotskyites or something like that, and putting in putting them in charge of a Walmart. You know, that that I think <laughs> is what the United States is going through. So I don't think it's I don't think any of this is is good at all. You know, the, the fact that, you know, commerce keeps running on some level ha basically has to do with uh, some gigantic companies that have a lot of international connections and clout. And uh, they're connected to an organization that can just print money for now. Mm -hmm. um, but but other than that, it's all hollowed out. It's gone. Well, speaking of the uh, 2020 election, what, what do you make of the claims that it was not altogether on the up and up? The way I see it is that only a fool would think that the United States is a democracy. <laughs> yeah. And that's how it looks from the outside. It's anything but a democracy. Mm -hmm. and, and if before, you know, the Amer Americans had some 
you know, basically could walk into the room with a chip on their shoulder and declare that they're the shining city on the hill and everybody should emulate them. Now that's just sad. That's just rantings of crazy people. Nobody would listen to that nonsense anymore. Mm-hmm. It, so on, on, to that extent, the, the reputation has been completely ruined. There's no bringing it back. Is there any equivalent to uh, wokery, as I call it, over in Russia these days? Uh, well, that's a, actually a funny story. These people who are basically equivalent to, to the woke kind had been cultivated by a lot of foreign interests in Russia. And um, uh, the Russians viewed it the same way as medical laboratories view petri dishes with vile bacteria in them. <laughs> hmm, interesting. Uh, we'll we'll look, at, look at it under the microscope when we get it get a chance you know in the meantime let's just give them more jelly it went on that way uh, at various times these people managed to get maybe one percent of the vote in st petersburg and moscow but now all of that has been pretty much reeled in um and uh in the meantime they've committed so many illegal acts blatantly illegal acts such as uh uh enticing uh, minors to commit crimes, uh, that there's no chance for them to bounce back ever again. So th- that's pretty much gone. And Russian politics is really, really, really boring. I yeah. mean, Th- it, that you know, could be a good thing. It's a good thing because it's all about, you know, roads and bridges and, and, um, how many, uh, high schools are, uh, substandard in terms of, uh, uh, their gyms. Various things like that. Um, how many federal troops are available to fight forest fires? Uh, it's all very boring stuff. Uh, Dimitri, how do your Russian friends and you know just the people that you talk to regard this ongoing collapse, what seems to be an ongoing collapse of the USA? Well, the truth about the Russians is that they find Russia so incredibly interesting that they have very little attention span for the rest of the world. It's a huge country. It, it's extremely diverse. It's got lots of interesting stuff going on within it. And uh, the Russians tend to be very focused on themselves and not really paying a huge amount of attention. Um, so you don't talk about this? Not you, you can't really get people interested in the United States, uh, except for jokes. <laughs> I mean, I tell people little vignettes about the, the United States, like to give you a particular example, uh, you know, a question is, why do we call the Americans uh, pindosi, for instance? That's a derogatory term. Well, pindos means penguin in Serbian, and the, the term uh, dates from when NATO destroyed Yugoslavia. Uh, when there were uh, American GIs running around former Yugoslavia, and people noticed that they walked like penguins because their packs are so heavy. Because your typical American GI lugs around a backpack with just everything within it. Yeah, I've heard it's about 60 pounds uh, minimum. Yeah, it's 60 60 pounds minimum. And and, you know, the Russians, when they march into battle, they could be stripped to the waist because, you know, they just basically do whatever is the most efficient for killing the enemy. They yeah, it's not about camping. You know. It's not about camping. And then when I explain to them that the Americans are um, required to carry 60 pounds because otherwise that would void their health insurance and they would have to <laughs> pay for the for their own injuries if injured in battle. <laughs> The Russians just can't stop laughing. And there, that's just one example. But there are lots of other things like that about the Americans that if you tell Russians, they just fall down and laugh. And and so that's basically what I try to do is be entertaining. Yeah. Well, how about the, uh, the public manifestation in newspapers, television, and other media? How do they talk about the country, uh, the USA? I watch the nightly news in, in, in Russia, uh, Channel One News, uh, fairly regularly. It's mostly about ridicule. Uh-huh. And it's not like you have to make anything up to make the United States look ridiculous. All you have to do is tell the truth. And, um, you know, that's that's pretty much 
the butt of Russian jokes at this point is the United States and uh, uh, and the Ukraine. Uh, the Ukraine, because it's it's much more intelligible to the Russians and closer, you know, it's a Russian-speaking country nearby. Um, you know, that that gets the brunt of it. You know, yeah. There's a um, there's a nightly television show that's so, so, so political. It's supposed to be political analysis. The evening with Vladimir Solovyov. But uh, my nickname for that show is uh, "What the fuck is wrong with the Ukrainians?" <laughs> because that's pretty much what it is about. <laughs> that's pretty much. There's a lot to talk about, I suppose. And if I, yeah, and if and if I hosted a, a show on Russian television, it would probably be called, you know, "What the fuck is wrong with the Americans?" Yeah, it would be funny as hell. My theory uh, about uh, sort of around what we're talking about is. There's all this chatter in America about how the Russians are constantly meddling in our affairs in order to destabilize us. But it seems to me that we're doing such a good job of it on our own that all they have to do is sort of sit back and watch. Well, yes, Americans can't really um, look in the mirror. That's the, that's the big problem. Americans can't bring themselves to look at themselves in the mirror. So they always have to point at somebody else. So it's evil, evil Russians. And the Russians look at that and they say, well, you know, that, that, that has nothing to do with us. You know, it's just internal American politics. Uh, but then the Americans do something stupid like uh, block uh, natural gas deliveries to Germany or something. Just basically because that's an expression of their internal politic, political dislike for Russia or what they think is Russia. So that really hurts the United States more than it hurts Russia because, you know, where else are they going to get natural gas? Right. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's certainly a conversation piece because uh, that does threaten the business. Yeah. Let, let's uh, move along to something slightly different. Um, after the Soviet collapse, the U.S. sent a lot of so-called experts like economist Jeffrey Sachs over to Russia to, uh, quotation marks, help out. From your view, what were they up to and, and what was the consequence of that? Well, basically what they really wanted was to uh, uh, dismember Russia, uh, make it into a client state, um, dismantle every type of productive capacity that existed in Russia, and uh, make the Russian population destitute, completely dependent on, on imports of every kind, while turning over the control of all natural resources within Russia to transnational corporations managed by Western banks. That mm -hmm. was their goal. Mm -hmm. And uh, they sort of were succeeding up until the year 2000, maybe although there were glimmers that they were failing at it before. But after the year 2000 and very steadily after that, um, it became clear that Russia was having none of it. Mm -hmm. And so basically um, um, all, all, everything having to do with the energy sector, everything ha ha having to do with uh, uh, important productive uh, sectors of the economy has a big government participant at this point. Basically, it's it's now a state capitalist uh, model that is closer to the Chinese model. And uh, in the meantime, you know, uh, drinking your own Kool Aid can be fatal. And and so what we're what we're seeing in the West, uh, in Western Europe, is this idea that well. Let the market decide everything, and the free market is everything. And and uh, uh, let's introduce spot market prices for for oil and natural gas. And oh, lo and behold, now gas is suddenly five hundred and 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 thirty dollars per million cubic meters, um, per thousand cubic meters, uh, set breaking all records. Well, that's the spot price, and that's only fair. Uh, so they basically laid a huge trap for themselves. Uh, as far as de-industrializing Russia, well, Russia now makes just about every brand of car in the world, and, and a lot of them are made for export because Russia makes many more cars than Russia needs. 
And, uh, you know, that's pretty much how it goes. Um, it all backfired grandly. What was uh, uh, Putin's uh, role in stabilizing or restabilizing that society? Uh, what did he have to do and, and what were the difficulties involved? Well, I would say that he he's a, you know, a, a very uh, good leader when it comes to riding some kind of a, a, a horrible, angry beast, which was Russian society after the 90s. Uh, he basically channeled a lot of anger in a productive direction, producing fantastic results in record time. Mm -hmm. I don't think that he personally, individually orchestrated every last bit of it. He just basically pointed people in the right direction and said, go. And they went. And uh, the results were stunning. You know, I, I'm curious. One of the things that always that I always wondered about was how, after 75 years of essentially having no commerce of a normal kind, uh, Russia developed a commercial sector. How is commerce uh, going in America, by which I mean, you know, shopping and, you know, being able to get normal products? Well, Russia had, um, or the Soviet Union, had a huge economy, one of the largest in the world. It supplied not just Russia, but a whole slew of, of uh, other countries with manufactured products. But it was organized um, in a strange it, way for distribution. It was organized in a very streamlined fashion for distribution. And it, it was rather effective in a lot of ways. It failed at producing consumer goods. And, you know, if that is your gold standard, then yes, it failed. But light industry is not all there was. Uh, and other parts of it did rather well, in fact. What happened uh, after the Soviet collapse is there was basically, uh, for, for a period of time, sort of uh, free enterprise free-for-all, and then it congealed into uh, a set of uh, corporations and holding companies, and, and uh, now there are supermarket chains and, and uh, all the rest of it, because what they basically did is, okay, well, we have this uh, silly economy of, of kiosks and, and uh, little private entrepreneurs. Let's, let's look at how the rest of the world does it. And they just basically copied it uh -huh. and uh, all of it. And then they figured out what was wrong with uh, the way it applied to Russia and fixed that as well. So, um, you know, now Russia basically has this uh, mixed model with uh, a lot of... Uh, strategic enterprises, having a lot of government participation, and a lot of light industry, which is very lightly regulated, uh, with a, a very transparent tax regime, very lenient tax regime, I would say. And it's, it's a really uh, good environment for a lot of uh, private entrepreneurs. People can run a business here and uh, pay 6% uh, tax, flat tax, no matter how much they make. Mm -hmm. uh, up to some very high limit well, based on their earnings, uh, which is basically one of the best tax regimes at all. And if, and if you're just a hairdresser or something like that, you pay even less, you pay 4%. So it's, it's a very lenient, uh, convenient way for small business to operate. And there are a lot of them in Russia. Yeah, and so it sounds like it requires a whole lot less cheating. Well, uh, you know, the, the Prime Minister Mishustin, Mikhail Mishustin, was previously head of, uh, of, of the tax authority for mm -hmm. all of the Russian Federation. And uh, the reason he got the job, got this fantastic promotion, was that his, his performance in his former job was absolutely stellar. You basically don't need to fill out any forms, tax forms in Russia. You can just basically do it through your smartphone. Mm hmm a lot of taxes get paid at the point of sale. So there's really nothing. The moment you pay for something, the tax for it is already paid. Mm -hmm. um, no accounting boondoggles of any sort. And he pioneered this idea, basically saying, well, we have all of this computer capacity. Why aren't we using it to make people's lives easier? Yeah, we use it to make people's lives more complicated. The United States definitely has the most hellish tax system in the world. I <laughs> Dimitri, do you think America will require foreign assistance at some point in the future? 
I don't know that it will get any. So <laughs> whether it requires any or not is is sort of beside the point. It will get some amount of assistance, uh, you know, uh, digging the warheads out of the uh, Minuteman pits in the ground so that they don't leak uh, radionuclear guidance into the ground. Things like that. Yeah. Uh, nuclear reservations will, will probably need uh, a lot of international help. As far as the rest, I'm not sure that you know anybody will station peacekeepers within the United States because it's it's the wrong kind of environment for that. A little too warlike. You know, peacekeepers require peace, and uh, the United States is not a peaceful country. Do you think we could end up in something like a civil war here? It's already happening. Look at the murder rate. Look at the trend line for for the murder rate in in the big cities, Chicago, for instance. Mm -hmm. It's already a war. It's been the country has been at war with itself since I can remember. Yeah, and we do do a poor job of of recognizing that for what it is. I, I think I, I want to shift gears a little again. The COVID nineteen disease has complicated the American collapse scene and and indeed the uh, the whole operation of the world but how do you see its role in this whole melodrama it's the only kind of warfare that the United States is possibly capable of at this point you know having failed in you know Vietnam and and Korea and and, uh, Iraq and now Afghanistan Yemen to the to the extent that the United States was involved in it Libya, to the to the extent that it was, uh, you know, a U.S. project. The United States cannot win against any adversary, no matter how weak. It cannot even stand up to the proper, well-armed adversaries such as uh, Russia or China. It's basically, you know, completely out of its league as far as that. It used to have this nuclear triad of. Uh, uh, interconnect, intercontinental ballistic missiles and, and nuclear submarines and, and, and bombers, nuclear bombers. All of that advantage is negated. It used to have a huge fleet, but now, uh, uh, you know, aircraft carrier fleet, but now those aircraft carriers can be taken out from a safe distance, safe standoff distance. Now, hold that, on a second. Are you saying that the COVID-19 disease uh, was an American war project? Well, the United States built all of these secret, pseudo-secret military laboratories around the world, especially around Russian and Chinese borders, where they collected uh, genes from local inhabitants and looked for ways to target them using uh, various uh, viral and bacterial agents. Uh, they got caught red-handed doing it because they tried doing it right within Russia and got kicked out. Um, samples were confiscated. So the, none of those things are secret. What I'm saying is that bio-warfare is the only kind of warfare that uh, the United States could even conceivably try. Mm -hmm. There's a great deal of confusion about who actually uh, started this thing, at least in the USA. Uh, there's confusion about whether it came from China, whether some combination of labs in the USA uh, manufactured it, or what? Well, yes, that's the fog of war. And that's the beauty of war, is that uh, nobody uh, really knows who started it. But it's like, uh, you know, that, that gun hanging on the wall. Eventually it has to go off. And so, or whatever. so what's the consequence of, of the COVID-19 getting loose in the world? Oh, well, the consequence is that Russia and China treated it as a bio-warfare drill because this virus, just like most things that the U.S. does, it, it just grandly misfired and turned out to be much less lethal on the one hand. On the other hand, China and Russia turned out to be very well prepared for it, whereas the United States was not prepared for it at all. Uh, so the United States suffered much more from it than Russia or China. But from from other, all the other perspectives, it's a plausible deniability. It, it was leaked from a lab in China, maybe, but that but that that lab was getting money from the U.S. And oh, by the way, that virus was also found in the U.S. before the the leak in China, 
And, and so the finger pointing can be absolutely endless. But what really happened is that, you know, basically Russia and China now can produce um, effective and relatively harmless vaccines against it uh, quickly based on uh, pre-existing patterns that they had sitting on the shelf, whereas the U.S. went full hog on these highly experimental, untested techniques that are turning out to be uh, relatively ineffective. And possibly dangerous. And not possibly dangerous, dangerous. What role do you think China is playing in the current uh, melodrama of uh, the American sort of shredding of American uh, power? Well, uh, China still sells quite a lot of product to the, to the United States, but it's um, doing funny things to the idea that uh, it's cheap to build things in China and ship them to the, to the United States. And it turns out that it's very easy to basically uh, cause little dislocations within uh, the container shipping business, uh, such as failing to ship containers back or, or uh, closing some, uh, some port because of the coronavirus scare or any number of things that basically hugely drive up, drive up the cost of shipping containers specifically to the United States. So it's like this... Chinese import surcharge. Yes, you Americans can print all the dollars you want, but we're going to confiscate as many of those dollars as we feel like. You know, that's the new bargain. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's been going on for a while, and I don't see any reason to see it stopping, except China is making strides and diversifying its export streams to the rest of the world and away from the United States. Well, China, of course, has its own problems, and namely, it, it came pretty late to the game of industrializing, and it has few oil resources. So uh, how do you imagine that's going to work for them? Well, uh, the coronavirus is very helpful in, in uh, combating the effects of peak oil because uh, it, it allows you to basically tweak hydrocarbon consumption in, in various ways. Yeah. So you close some borders and suddenly jet fuel consumption drops or you close all the small businesses and, and offices and suddenly gasoline consumption drops. And uh, you can play games like that pretty much uh, endlessly to drive countries down into the hole of deindustrialization uh, where they no longer matter uh, internationally. And, and so that's going to be proceeding a pace, and, and, and the coronavirus scare is an instrument that's being used to, to basically make, make peak oil look like a medical problem. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, you were out of the country for most of the uh, Donald Trump epic. What did you make of Donald Trump and his role in, in the American collapse scene? Well, it's another example of the fish rotting from the head. You know, he's, he's basically a carnival barker sort of person. He's almost completely un, un, unintellectual, I would say. Um, yeah, based he, on his use of language. Yes, his fractured syntax is very, very he's, representative of, of the quality of his thought. I think that basically what, what he did was he, he, he stepped into uh, – a completely rotten political system, and one because at that point he could just knock over all of his competitors with a feather because he, he wasn't playing the same game. Now, all you have to do is basically say, I'm not playing your game, I'm playing my own game, and suddenly they, they all might as well just not exist. They all just wither because all they've been trained to do as American politicians is to repeat the same problem over and over again. The moment they have to say something unscripted, you know, they, their their mind explodes, their brains explode or seize, as as is the case with uh, with with Biden. But but you know, he's he's just another symptom of of a decayed and non functional political system. You know, now uh, you know it's too bad that we have Biden in the White House because I think Hunter Biden would be a much better president. You know, <laughs> smoking 
smoking crack, you know, dialing up whores, you know. Much more representative. That would be a very Kurt Vonnegut sort of ending to the to the whole melodrama. <laughs> Dimitri, you experienced uh, American high school, and you experienced American mm-hmm. suburbia, correct? Yes. Uh, Russia didn't have anything like that in 1990. H- how do you view suburbia's contribution to American collapse? Russia has huge cities where basically there are a lot of big buildings, people live compactly, uh, p- people live in neighborhoods where you basically have uh, a bunch of apartment buildings, parks, uh, uh, nurseries, uh, maternity clinics, uh, kindergartens, schools, maybe uh, a, a university or a few institutes, uh, a factory or two, all tied together using public transportation. And that's how people live. And, and they live in the same place, basically birth to death. They know all of their neighbors. Uh, there's nothing comp- comparable to that in the United States at all. The cities are very transient. Suburbia is relatively transient. And so it doesn't matter whether people live in a shoebox or, you know, a shipping container. It doesn't matter where you put them. They're, they won't stay put for a very long time. Now, I've seen counterexamples to that because uh, after living in Boston for a long time, which is probably the most transient place imaginable, except for the Yankee Brahmins who never go anywhere at all, um, they're just refusing to go away, I guess. Uh, but uh, then I moved to South Carolina, and there you you basically have societies, plural, that have pretty much coexisted for a really long time, and their relations with each other have, have gelled uh, to a point where they recognize each other from the distance and know how to deal with each other. You know? mm-hmm. There's there's a level of finesse uh, that, that uh, kind of... Uh, is a veneer over um, kind of an undercurrent of violence. And it's a very interesting uh, semi-tribal society that I I was uh, privileged to observe for a couple of years that really changed my mind about what America is or could be. So you found a really startling difference between Yankee culture and uh, the culture of the South. Not just even specifically the South, because you you can find enclaves of various kinds in the Midwest, too. You can go to Pennsylvania and find the same thing. It's just that there's this cosmopolitan United States um, that is just completely different from a huge chunk of the country, and which will endure, uh, and to what extent, is a major outstanding question in my mind, because I feel that these... Uh, relatively insular societies um, have what it takes to survive, whereas the jutsam and flotsam that circulates around California and the East Coast, uh, you know, the the Northeast Coast, uh, could just be gone. Could just yeah, it seems very fragile. Blow away. Yes, it it it, it has it, it doesn't have any internal structure at all. Do you have an opinion about the whole Klaus Schwab Great Reset story? Uh, is there anything to it as far as you can see? And how might such a tiny clack of schemers ever manage to construct such a conspiracy? Oh, well, it's not a conspiracy if everybody knows about it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's more of a dumb idea. Uh, basically, people who are extremely rich suffer from certain uh, brain defects as a result. Uh, extreme wealth is, is, is really detrimental to mental functioning. Yeah, it's um, like kind of like a drug. It's, it's worse than that. It's like a brain parasite. Uh, they, they, they kind of think like money bags. They, they use a different kind of logic I call money bag logic, which differs from normal human logic. And uh, there's a class of people called money bag whisperers, and uh, Klaus is one of them, Klaus Schwab. So he, he's a very experienced money bag handler and money bag whisperer, and, and he's uh, conceived of these uh, ridiculous theories for how to revolutionize the world. And, uh, of course, the, the money bag brains uh, loved it. They lapped it up. And uh, then they decided, well, 
uh, okay, let's go with it. This sounds like a great plan. Use the coronavirus as an excuse to to do this great reset. But okay, so we, we need to pull in uh, Russia and China because without them, not, none of this is going to work. So they, they talk to Putin and they talk to Xi and, and they both are, are basically told, well, whatever you're thinking doesn't matter because we're doing our own thing. Uh, you can join us if you want on our own terms, but we're not going along with your plan. And that, that was a bit of shock. And basically to translate from, from what was actually said to what was actually meant, um, the, the, the Davos crowd said, uh, please help us. Hmm. And well, Western Europe seems to be it. following a, a parallel collapse trajectory to the U.S. with some slightly different features. Well, yes. Western Europe has zero ability to solve its own problems because for several generations now it has selected leadership uh, that basically was trained to play follow the leader with the Americans in the lead except yeah. the Americans are no longer in the lead. So now you have a bunch of followers, but no leaders. Mm-hmm. And, and so they're, they're just uh, wandering the wilderness. Um, you know, some, some countries know, know what they're doing a little better. I think Hungary is a good example of a country that is uh, more self-directed than the rest. Yeah, well, they've been in the news here in the past uh, 10 days because one of our leading... Uh, television talking heads went over there and and uh, reported on how they were handling their border situation and did a long interview with Viktor Orban and it really disturbed the wokesters of America. Mhm. Yeah, Orban is very disturbing to to uh, the rest of the Europeans because he basically says our history, our culture, the rest of you go pound sand. Yeah. That's he wants to preserve it. his own culture. Uh, Yes, he he cares about his his people. He's a patriot. He loves his his own people more than anyone else. So yes, that's very disturbing to them. Um, but the you know there are other examples as well. Um, the Ukraine is the star, star, starkest example of a, a wannabe European country uh, that is falling apart faster than it could possibly join the EU. So it'll. It's not going to join the EU because there will be nothing left by the time the time comes. Yeah. Say so you're a bit of a computer nerd or geek. Uh, I mean, you've you've actually made a living as an IT specialist. Do you have a view of how Bill Gates fits into uh, all of this? The unfortunate fact is that you know Microsoft still has a, a pseudo monopoly in operating systems. You know, Bill Gates was basically handed the opportunity to do so. Um, it's an example of uh, extreme corruption um, that was allowed by by the U.S. government. He made all of his money from that. What he's been doing since that has been basically, you know, his uh, pension for trying to refashion himself, reinvent himself as a... a, a a Dr. Evil wannabe. <laughs> I think that he makes a pretty plausible Dr. Evil. Yeah. You know, I mean, he could he could be better. You know, he could be funnier, for one <laughs> thing. But I think he's a pretty good Dr. Evil. If the U.S. does collapse, how deep do you think it goes here? And can you paint a word picture concisely of what that country looks like and feels like afterwards? Not really, because um, everybody who will participate um, in this collapse will pretty much be stranded. Their view of their own country will collapse down to wherever they can easily get to on foot or by bicycle or, or whatever. Keep in mind that there is no public transportation system and that the private transportation system is extremely fragile yeah falling apart yes and and uh if it if it becomes non-existent then everybody's pretty much stranded where they are and suddenly um 
it's, it's pointless to say what's going on in America because there will be no America. Yeah, they'll just be isolated regions and pods of, of people. Yes. So there'll be parts of the country that will pretty much look like Central America because it will, they'll be full, full of uh, Central Americans. Did you ever happen to notice the uh, web page that uh, was put up by Deagle.com, the military analyst, saying that the U.S. population would be reduced to 99 million by 2025? Mm-hmm. What did you make of I that? Did. They never really explained themselves very well. I never saw a particular page where they uh, really analyzed their own conclusions. But what did you make of it? Well, more importantly, they didn't show their math. So you can come up with whatever numbers you want, but if nobody knows how you came up with them, yeah. it's like uh, you might as well work for the IPCC at that point. There's something going on inside the computer, and it's a supercomputer. Therefore, it couldn't be wrong. Um, same thing here. So I, I don't know what to make of it. Okay. Well, any uh, concluding fugitive thoughts about uh, American Collapse from the guy who uh, wrote Reinventing Collapse? Well, I'm really sorry that I was right. Okay? <laughs> I apologize. Well, I don't think you need to do that. I think, uh, you know, we both wrote books about collapse in a different, in different lexicons, shall we say. I really admired your prose and your sense of humor. I thought you were a marvelous writer and still are a marvelous writer. Um, how do people follow your excellent writings on the web? Well, I'm, I'm on Patreon and Subscribestar. I still have a, a blog that I, uh, that I keep on, on blogspot.com. Uh, but it's going away because blogspot is going away. So um, it's mainly uh, Patreon. Well, I will get started with something else. And I do have cluborlov.com reserved. Mm -hmm. So if somebody wants to write down one URL for keeping in touch with me, it's cluborlov.com. That'll be pointing to something useful forever. Okay, good. That's your home base. And it's been a pleasure talking to you and reconnecting after uh, quite a few years. You sound like you're pretty happy where you are. It sounds like you've got a pretty good seat for the spectacle that's going on in the Western Hemisphere. And um, I look forward to talking to you again now that we, we've discovered we can do it. I do too. Thank you very much. Okay, we will ride again, Dmitry Orlov. <laughs>